And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. God, would you help us to understand your word? We desire to know and understand that which you have for us this morning so that we would be uh, encouraged and instructed as you would have for us. So by your spirit, help us to see what we need to see and help us to learn what we need to learn. Help us to change where we need to change according to your word. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in a couple of hours... The Philadelphia Eagles will play the Cincinnati Bengals, I am told. It's happening in Cincinnati. Do I have that right, you sports fans? So if you were in Cincinnati today and you were walking around and you were, let's say you were downtown or you were in the parking lots outside the stadium and you're walking in, how would you be able to tell who the Bengals fans are and who the Eagles fans are? It's pretty easy, right? Jerseys. Okay, certain things would happen during the game that would cause a certain portion of the audience to cheer, to celebrate. Other things would happen during the game that would cause, well, those same things might cause the other portion to moan and groan, right? So what I'm wanting you to press into is just thinking, if you look at a group of people, what are their defining characteristics? How do you note them? How do you spot them? Let's say you were in the early church, This sermon that we've been studying for the past few weeks on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And and then in the days that followed, in the early days of the church, what would those Christians look like? How would you identify who the Jesus people are? How does it work? If you think about in other places of Scripture, go back to Exodus 34. You remember when Moses saw God on the mountain? He received the Ten Commandments. He comes down off the mountain and his face is shining, right? I mean... Get it? Shine. Um, but so Moses is at, like, you're able, wow, he's been with God. His face is shining. Was it that way at the early days of the church? No. But the temple is full of people. Uh, the, this, this text is going to show us that the, the people are coming to the temple every day. And how would you be able to figure out, oh, those those are the people who just come here day after day because they've been doing it for hundreds of years and they're waiting for the Messiah. But you look at this group of people and the things that make them moan and the things that make them cheer. Being facetious there, but what what is the characteristic? They weren't wearing jerseys, but you look at this one group of people and you say, oh, they think the Messiah has come. They're Jesus people. What did that look like? This passage tells us in a little bit of a summary form, here's the things they were about. Here's the things that defined them. Here's the things you would have noticed if you had been with them. For those of us at Shawnee Baptist Church, what should our lives look like as Jesus people? Here in this church, what should be some of those defining characteristics? Let's look at this little summary statement. Luke takes these five verses from 42 to 47, and he just says, this is what the early days of the church was like. And he describes what, what their characteristics were. Not the jerseys that they wore, but the things that defined them. The things that they were devoted to. And it's instructive to help us. It encourages us to think about what the gospel does in people's lives. But it also helps us understand, well, by God's Spirit, by His grace... Let's pray that the same kinds of things continue to happen even in our midst. So what do we learn from the church's early days? Let's look at this in a couple of different ways. But let me start in verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. What do we learn from the church's early days? Verse 42 starts this way. And they devoted themselves 
to several things. Luke is going to list out four things. Let me explain what we've covered so far and why is Luke saying that they devoted themselves to these things. Remember, the day of Pentecost has just happened. After Christ's ascension, so after he was crucified, he rose into heaven and he told his believers, we covered this in chapter 1, stay there in Jerusalem because not many days from now you're going to be clothed with power from on high. There's this promise that the Old Testament spoke to that the Spirit was going to come. And that happens on the day of Pentecost. And you see the day of Pentecost recorded for us at the beginning of Acts chapter 2. And, and there's this outpouring of the Spirit... And uh, people begin to speak in languages as all the Jewish believers are gathered together, uh, some not from Jerusalem and other regions, they receive the Spirit and they begin to speak in languages that were known in other places. And they realize, what is going on? And Peter stands up and he preaches this sermon that we walked through a couple weeks ago. And in Peter's message, he tells the believers there, these were believers, these, or excuse me, he tells the crowd that's gathered there, they're religious people. Many of them were waiting for God to send a Messiah, but they weren't believers in the sense that they thought Jesus was that Messiah. And Peter stands up and he says, listen, Jesus that came, he really was the Son of God and the prophesied Messiah. And he traces it through the Old Testament. And he says, you guys killed him. And yet he didn't stay dead. He rose again, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. That's the point of Peter's sermon. And it's a reminder to all of us that that if we are going to have right relationship with God, it is only going to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. That our sins are what separate us from God. Peter had to stand up to the crowd and let them know that even though they were religious and even though they pursued God, they were a sinful people who needed a Savior. And the same is true for us. And Peter wanted them to know, and the Holy Spirit wants you to know, the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. The one who, uh, his death on the cross is what you need to have your sins paid for. And that any of us who turn from our sins and place our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ can have our sins forgiven. That's the point of Peter's sermon. That's the repentance that he calls them to. And then Luke wants us to know, here's here's a few of the things that take place in in the next days. So in the days and weeks after this sermon, in the early months of the church, they were devoted to four things. Here's the four things in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, one, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. All four of them get the little word, the. It sounds really official, right? They weren't just praying and breaking bread. They were devoted to the prayers and the breaking of bread and the, uh, devoted to the apostles' teaching. In these four things, we're going to walk through them, and some of the other verses help us explain a little bit of what they were about. But you can almost divide what they were devoted to uh, into two categories. There's two of them that are oriented towards God, and two of them that are oriented towards one another. So you might say the one source, the, in their vertical orientation, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to prayers. They're the bookends on the end of that four list, that list of four things. But then, horizontally to one another, they're devoted to the fellowship and the breaking of bread. Let's unpack some of these things. And both of them are important in the early life of the church. And they're both still very important when we understand them for the life of the church today. And by the way, it's very easy in what we like about church, in what we like about our relationship with God, to get somewhere on one side or the other of this spectrum uh, of the of these things that are important oriented towards God or these things that are important oriented to one another you you'll see people that um, they 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 feel their relationship with God is good they enjoy coming to church they like the teaching they the, but but they're really just in and out for whatever the service is an hour an hour and a half something like that and but don't give me the fellowship and being like the life on life together you see some people that are on that side of the spectrum. And equally, there are some who are like, okay, I endure the teaching. I have to put up with that. But can't church be about more, more of the relationships, the fellowship, right? And, and these two are not pitted against one another in Scripture as if, we, uh, as if somehow there's a right side of the spectrum to be on. We, we need both for the church to be health, healthy. And you see both in the passage here. Let's start with these. 
that are um, oriented towards God. By the way, as I get started on this, let me just remind you, you'll hear us say this frequently as we go through Acts. This is a narrative portion of Scripture. What I mean by that is it's, it's describing events. It's not prescriptive. So even as I go through it this morning, I will try to make application. We learn this from it and we apply it to our lives, but we do have to be really careful that uh, we'll get ourselves in trouble going through Acts if we say, see, he described it happened once, therefore it always has to happen in the exact same way in the exact same manner now. We'll try to see where are, where are principles repeated as commands in other places of the New Testament, but we won't get to a lot of that this morning as we go through the book. We will, and that helps you understand, okay, in a, in a, in a passage of Scripture that describes, how do we know now what we're actually supposed to do? So we'll have to try to balance some of that out as we go through it. But let's look at the two things that are oriented towards God, the apostles' teaching and the prayer. Let's talk about it. In verse 42, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This idea of being devoted, it's this idea of continuing even in perseverance. Likely, it was happening every single day. Verse 46 tells us that they continued, if, if some of your Bibles say day by day, another way to translate that is every day. This concept that daily they went to the temple and they were receiving the apostles' teaching, something that was happening regularly. It's going to be a theme throughout the book of Acts that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. If we were to try to define that, what, what is the apostles' teaching? Because you and I don't, we don't devote ourselves to this. It is the same teaching, but not in the same way. It comes to us in a different way. So we need to define it and press in. Remember, in the early days of the church, the church has just been born. This is in the days and weeks and months after Christ's ascension. They don't have yet the completed New Testament canon. They don't have the scriptures like you and I have them. So there was this office, this position of apostle who was appointed by God, who had the authority and office to, to give teaching from Christ himself. And so when they, it says that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, they were hearing from God. They were learning everything that God had commanded, even in the Great Commission where Jesus said to teach all things I have commanded to you. This started to come down through apostolic teaching, and they were devoted to it. They wanted to learn it. And for you and I now, as this continues now, as, as the scriptures were, began to be recorded, even in some of the later New Testament, as they begin to have the church established, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. As they begin to understand both the Old Testament, as they have some of these letters that they needed to be devoted to, and some of this apostolic teaching that is inscripturated in scripture for us, and now... You and I continue today to be a people who are devoted to learning from God. It's the same teaching, but in a different form that we are learning from His Word. And so it includes both what you're hearing me do this morning in preaching, but it's probably not even the primary way. The primary way is through the Word as, as given to us. And so only to what extent I'm faithful to the Word and the preaching are we continuing to hear from God in the teaching of His Word. But it means for you as a people, we want to be devoted to God's Word. For us as a church, we want to keep God's Word central in what we're learning from, in what we are understanding, in where we are growing. And the Bible then becomes central in all of our life. Is God's Word something that is central to you, that you could, learning from God is something you are devoted to. It must be a mark in our lives as individuals, but certainly in the church as well. Well, not only devoted to the apostles' teaching, but they were also devoted to prayer. The last in the list of four, but it's another one that helps us think about our vertical relationship with God. And uniquely, he says they were devoted to the prayers in the plural form. And so it's potentially likely that there were some set established, patterned prayers, if they were going to the temple daily, they would have been used to this kind of a practice in part of their Judaism of worshiping at the temple. But it's also probably some spontaneous prayers, prayers more like you think of when a church comes together and prays, uh, because it says that they were daily in each other's homes and praising God, and prayer would have been included in that. And so, one of the things you'll see as we go through the book of Acts, prayer becomes a a central mark of the early church. And even preceding 
uh, some of the important things God will do in the life of the church. Prayer and the church coming together to pray becomes incredibly important. It becomes a defining mark and a characteristic. What did Jesus' people look like? How do you spot them? They're devoted to the apostles' teaching and they're devoted to the prayers. And they're coming together to say, this is important for us. Prayer is one of those things that has become difficult in in our day, in our age, to carve out times for the church corporately to do it. We're trying to think about ways to keep it in this corporate gathering, even as we try to expand some of those and think about ways that we can pray. But I'm just letting you know, I don't have the answer. I don't know for sure what this needs to look like. But I I am burdened that we as a church would pray more together corporately. That we would say, of all the things we could be doing, we need to come together and pray. So, let's pray that God shows us how to be devoted to that. Because it is something that's important as a mark and a pattern established throughout the church. Well, there's a couple of things that are vertical. Devoted to the apostles' teaching. They're devoted to prayers. What about horizontally, to one another? Uh, How does the fellowship and the breaking of bread fit together? In verse 42, it says that they were devoted to the fellowship and they were devoted to the breaking of bread. Let me start with fellowship. What do you think of when you think of fellowship? In order to understand what he's talking about here, it's it's not just time talking and it's not time around food. That's probably two of the things we most think of uh, when we think of fellowship because breaking of bread is separate. He calls it separate. And we're probably not real help. We, when I say we, sometimes we as church leaders, like we'll, in a moment here, we'll have a, a break in between Shawnee studies and, and uh, the service. And I might even say something. I often have said things like, hey, you've got 10 or 15 minutes to fellowship. And we, we learn to think fellowship is talk time. Fellowship is just anytime Christians are generally together, fellowship is happening. But I don't know if that's the best way to understand what a, a New Testament biblical concept of fellowship is. If we try to define it, this is the, the biblical word, and I, I don't often use the original languages, but this is one a lot of you have probably heard of. So let me just give you the word. Uh, koinonia is the word for fellowship. And, and sometimes when we start new groups, especially groups that are fellowshipping and relating to one another, we, we, you know, the label might be uh, the koinonia is the name of the group. Some of you have maybe heard of that kind of thing or a koinonia committee or something like that that seeks to keep, stay connected in fellowship. It comes up 19 times in the New Testament. This is the only time in Acts. It's a favorite word of Paul. Paul uses it like 14 times. So what does it mean? It means to share in something. But there's a, a common bond in something that is shared. And therefore, if that's the case, I think, I've been trying to work through it this week on a working definition, and I'll just let you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm at the end of this working definition. So, if you have a better w- way of saying this, I'm hoping I get some good emails this week. I'm hoping somebody doesn't have to say you actually didn't define that right. But um, uh, this is a working definition that, if, it, okay, if, if fellowship is something we share in, that means it's not something that we do as much as it is, it's a byproduct that we experience when there's that something we share in. Does that make sense? It, a fellowship is something that uh, we have because of a common bond and a common interest. Therefore, koinonia will be experienced around that thing that we fellowship in. So you don't, you know, if you just look at society in the world today, you don't divide people into those that do and don't fellowship. We all fellowship. The question is, who or what are we fellowshipping around, right? And so think about the times that you're with other Christians from this church, and maybe in your mind you've you've wanted to say, well, at least it's talk time. We're with each other. Aren't we fellowshipping? Well, yes, you're fellowshipping. The question is, who or what are you fellowshipping in, right? Is Is it politics? Is it sports? Is it hobbies? Is it kids' interests? Or or like, you know, because of our kids, we all get brought into groups where we're going to fellowship in those communities, be it sports, school, those kinds of things. Or is it Jesus? Now, in all of those other things I mentioned, those might be the opportunity that we cross paths with other people and we, we seek to 
be intentional in how do we, maybe it is a hobby that has brought us together, but in our Christian relationship and our desire to be intentional, how do we get the fellowship in Jesus from this initial interest that has brought us together, then now we actually have fellowship in Jesus. That's probably something that we ought to be thinking about and understanding how this works. One of the ways that this um, sharing of fellowship worked itself out. I want to show you more about what this fellowship means because verses 44 and 45, when it says that they shared in something, it wasn't just that they shared in the apostolic teaching of who Jesus is. Uh, there, were, there were lots of things that they shared in. This passage uniquely brings, one of the ways it worked itself out is they shared all things in common. There's even a financial element to the way that they shared and the fellowship that they had with one another. So if you look at verse 44 and verse 45, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. These are really interesting verses that says that they were, they were financially very generous for those who had need, and that was a part of this concept behind fellowship. They don't come back and use the word fellowship again in verses 44 and 45, but it's at least part of how it was worked out and played out here in this concept. Let, let, me, let me help you think through this and try to apply it a little bit. And again, this is one of those places where we have to be very careful, right? That we aren't, um, because we see something described here, we don't want to get like prescriptive and say, oh, they did it here, therefore you all must, right? Uh, This is not socialism here. Let me say that, right? Because one of the things you see, this was voluntary. It wasn't enforced that they had to sell their possessions and everyone share everything. This was just a common act of generosity. We could take this too far and we could say, okay, after the service, line up in this line if you're willing to sell something and line up in this line if you need something given to you and just talk to you, the person across. Like we're, we, That's not the application of where this is going to, right? But I do at least want to talk just a little bit about financial giving, even as it relates um, to giving to offerings in our church. You'll notice we didn't pass the offering plates this morning, but you do still have the opportunity to give both with the the box in the back and giving online. There's some other means. And, And I want to just say this as it relates to comments about giving and offering it's, it's not something you hear me preach on often, but when the text mentions it, we'll talk about how it applies in that setting. So when we get to Acts chapter 4, there's a very nearly identical paragraph where this is going to come up again. And there, it's actually a little bit more explicit in financial terms of what was taking place. And then the very next week... Uh, in our preaching calendar, because the the very next sermon at the beginning of Acts chapter 5 talks about Ananias and Sapphira and some of the ways that they got giving wrong and they were withholding. And so you're actually, over the next couple months, you'll hear me talk about giving uh, perhaps more frequently than those of you who have been here a long time. And that wasn't planned or staged that way, but perhaps providentially, just so you are aware, we, the church's fiscal calendar Uh, matches with the calendar of the year. So we're coming to the end of our fiscal calendar, just like we're all beginning to count down towards November and December. And we as leaders are trying to think forward and project what will ministries look like in the year ahead. And those of you that are paying attention know for the year we're maybe about 30,000 behind. And we're we're trying to think through and ask, uh, having some hard conversations of, is this a year that we have to tighten the belt and cut back on ministries when... Really, that doesn't fit our plans of going forward. What we'd like to be able to do is expand and grow a few ministries. So just be aware, praying through of how God might use your commitment to honoring him with giving back a portion as, as he has blessed you. It's good to evaluate in those kinds of things, and, and you'll know you're going to hear about it because Acts 4 and Acts 5, we'll talk about it again in a few months. Back to Acts, let's think about this giving here, right? It's not socialism, it was voluntary, but throughout Scripture, what you'll see is that God's people are called to generosity, to radical generosity. And it's an important thing to see, not just with their finances, even with their time and their relationships. Look at Acts chapter 2, look at verse 44 and 45, 
Um, let's look at verse 46. They were, verse 44 says they believed they were together. They had all things in common. Verse 46. Day by day they were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. So it's not just that their wallets were open to one another, but their lives. They were generous with their time, inviting one another to their tables. And this idea of the breaking of bread, as it's called in verse 42, the Lord's table could also be included in view here. But I think primarily the idea of breaking of bread uh, was the idea of being in each other's homes. And uh, the early church probably was celebrating the Lord's table with a large meal. But verse 46 makes it clear this was going on day by day. They're in each other's homes, and uh, it helps us understand, okay, if you are going to be generous with both time and money, let's think through this, all right? And this sharing, having this shared fellowship, this koinonia, getting to that point where we're willing to be generous to meet other people's needs and part of the reason I relate it to giving and offerings in the church, you know, in these early days of the church, they, didn't, they, they weren't as structured and organized. It was easy, just who has needs, who has something to sell, let's connect it. And then as things go, it gets a little bit more structured. You see Paul in Corinthians where he begins to other specific collections for specific needs and on the first day of the week set it aside. And so one of the ways we seek to establish some of these things is through budgets and those things. But... But we're not just talking about those finances. We're saying, okay, if we're going to be generous with our time and our money, there's a mindset that we have to think. Because if we're thinking about, well, how much do I have to give away? How much time do I need to spend with these people? Right? What's adequate? Some whom I don't even like. You're not thinking that. I'm just, you know, maybe the person next to you is thinking that or something, right? And, and, and how much of my money do I have to get away? If, if you're thinking, this is my time, this is my money, and what's the adequate portion that goes away, there we will never get to the right heart understanding of this radical generosity that the early church experienced. You'll see it more clearly in Acts 4 and 5. Uh, but there's, the, the understanding we need to have is this is all God's anyways. It's all Him. He's the one who has given us everything we have. We're just using what He has given us. It's His we're using his resources, time and money, for his purposes. That's when we begin to understand it will only get to the place we need to be when we understand it's his to start with, and then we can be generously sacrificial. And that is the standard that, that Scripture calls us to, to sacrifice on behalf of the needs of others, both our time and money. And it is a sacrifice. Let's acknowledge it. There's constraint here. If you're going to be generous to others, it constrains and you have to sacrifice, right? Um, if we use our time and money for others, that means we cannot use them for ourselves in the way we otherwise would. That's the definition of sacrifice and that's the scriptural standard of generosity. So as we think through that, both with time and money, right? And... Uh, we understand there are people in our midst who are filled with financial need. And so we understand there's times we need to address that. We also understand there are many in our midst who have been greatly financially blessed. Let's just be honest. This region of South Jersey, uh, 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 if you're at the standard median income, we recognize there's, there is room to live below your means so that we can be generous to others. But that's only if we're constraining ourselves. If we're trying to keep up to the standard of living of everyone else around here with all the same toys, all the same vacations, there's not going to be room to be generous with our money or with our time, right? If we pack our schedules full of the things I want to do, then we can't invest in others in relationships the way we want. It's worth evaluating and thinking through with my time, with my meals, with my uh, opening my home, am I able to invest in others in relationship in the way that God would have me to. It's a beautiful picture to have that kind of generosity because we want to be a people who are caring for one another. As you look at verse 46, when it talks about, verse 44, I should say, all who believed they were together, they had all things in common. You'll see it at the end of Acts chapter 4 that, that they, uh, they were distributing to those who had need you see it in verse 45, that they didn't want people to have needs. They're a community that looks out for one another and they cares. 
One of the things I want to just stop and say, and it is, it's worth praising God for, you as a people do great at caring for one another. The way that you are quick to jump on needs, uh, to um, provide meals for those who are sick and those who have hospital stays when little ones come along and we're able to jump in and provide for one another. You guys, you guys are a very caring body. And to whatever extent we on um, leadership are able to let you know about leads, needs, you jump in. Praise God. Keep going. Press in. How can we do that well? Um, we do, uh, just so you know, our church does have something called a fellowship fund that many of you give to regularly. By the way, this was really fun for me to study this week. I didn't realize. It's not the way it's used in Acts here, but that word koinonia, it's a minority meaning. There's three times in the New Testament, or at least three that I found. There could be more. Paul uses the word in, in the very terms of financial gift. Uh, and he uses the word koinonia to thank people for their, and the way it's translated is contribution. So when he says, thank you for your contribution, he says, thank you for your koinonia. You shared in, in this financial need I had. And uh, I just thought that was really cool. And the concept behind, or the meaning of what we're trying to do with our fellowship fund, that people give over and above their tithes and offerings so that the deacons can try to discreetly meet financial needs in the church. And that happens uh, And we need to know about those needs when those needs are there. It's not something that we typically broadcast because of that desire to be discreet. But praise the Lord when it does happen. And thank you for those that are encouraging in that way. Chris, I didn't give you a warning, but Chris Trundle is our deacon of member care. And we know there are needs in the church. I think we have an email address for you. If you're aware of needs in your own life that are financial needs, or maybe they're not financial needs, people that need... Uh, relationship, or they need help around their home, or this time of year need leaves raked and they're not able to do it. And perhaps you're not um, comfortable asking for the help yourself, but you would be able to let us know, hey, there's a member in our church that needs to be cared for. Shoot us an email, membercare at Shawnee Church. Describe the situation of a way that we can help with someone. And Chris Trundle, our deacon, gets that, and it goes to a group of guys that are on a team. Many of you have volunteered to say, if needs come through that, I'll help. I'll jump in so that we can be together, so that that's the true idea of that koinonia, that we're together in fellowship. Well, notice what it resulted in, and I need to do this briefly. I've used my time. But notice in verse 46, day by day they were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. This was something that was encouraging to them. Their hearts were glad and generous. Verse 43 even says that awe came upon every soul. This is that idea of the the fear of God. And as they see these signs and wonders are done, these people, they're worshiping God, they're glad, they're praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord adds to their number day by day those who were being saved. Notice that when, when this awe falls on the people and they're praising God, as they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, it has an outward effect and they have favor in the community, and then God adds to their number. Isn't that an encouraging thing? That the Lord added day by day those who were being saved. It wasn't the apostles' growth vision. It wasn't the apostles' strategic plan. It was people being who they should be, and the Spirit of God causing growth. Let it be so today. I I am convinced that God Himself has people that he wants to save. Do you believe that? As you think about these neighborhoods around this church, the neighborhoods you live in, the workplaces you work in, the the schools and the sports communities that your kids are involved in, the grocery stores that you shop in, the waiters and waitresses that serve you your meals at your favorite restaurants, God wants to save some of those people. The unreached people groups around the world. Corgi Indians? Did I come close? Kogwi. The Kogwi Indians and those people groups around the world. Oh, that God would raise up people to, to spread his message around the world. Yes, to the unreached people groups and to the people and communities and neighborhoods that God has put you in to reach. That's how our God works. He is still saving people. And don't you think 
don't you think that when we as a church of people focus on being who we should be, and, and, and we have the kind of relationship with God that we should, and it's vibrant, and it's real, and we're devoted to it, we're devoted both to God and to one another, well, then we'll let the Spirit of God work that He might bring some of those people into this community. I think that must be our focus. If we, as a people, put all of our focus on going out to the exclusion of our own walks with God, well, I don't think that's going to attract people. If we only focus exclusively on our own needs here, I also don't think that's going to attract people. We must focus on being the kind of people who we're supposed to be in our walks with God, devoted to His teaching, devoted to the prayer, devoted to one another, sharing this kind of fellowship, and at the same time, having our eyes on the community around us. And I think God will use that to give us favor and draw in those that He desires to save. Oh, would God do that here in our community. Let's pray that he would, even for our church. Let's go to him in prayer.